It's time for some added lore to the Outlast world with the brand new Halloween update released by Red Barrels. If you have not already and are interested in the full lore of Outlast Trials, be sure to check out our Season 1 Explained video to get up to date with all the lore that took place prior to this. Not to mention, if you want to see the new program that has been released, you can check it out here. In this video, we'll be expanding on the lore that we went over last time with the brand new documents that have just been released and can be found throughout the trials. As we get some more insight into what happened at the Sinyala facility in 1958 and 1959, which, let's be honest, won't be good. Let's just get straight into it. The first is a description about the guidelines being put in place by Murkov for their second phase of the Leith project. Deciding to separate and group the X-Pop by documenting archetypes and augmentations. If you remember the last video, the X-Pop are the people that the reagents can find throughout the trial to complement the prime asset associated with the area. The list includes Murkov's descriptions of each archetype, including General X-Pop, Heavy X-Pop, Pouncers, Screamers, Imposters, Berserkers, Night Hunters, and the much less scary description of the Pushers. Murkov wasted no time going into the depth of what each archetype in X-Pop entails, starting with the general X-Pop. If you remember the recruitment ideology of Murkov going into the creation of the trials back in 1956, they wanted to find people that wouldn't be missed, to find the bottom of the barrel. So when Murkov took them and possibly killed them during the trials, nobody would come looking for them. This includes the homeless and downtrodden, people that could easily be manipulated into chasing Murkov's false promises. These are the people that fall in the general X-Pop archetype. Lost men, people with a high degree of vanishability. Murkov actually lists a bunch of people they feel fit this category, such as drug addicts, felons, political dissidents, artists, leftists and hobos. They are to be left with minimal augmentations, and their previous involvement in phase 1 of the Lathe program have left them vulnerable to Murkov's sway and apparent conditioning. So they will listen to the prime assets and mold to the environment effortlessly. And if you want to know just how valuable these people are to Murkov, the last line clarifies it all. General X-Pop is considered expendable and should be periodically evaluated against the cost of feeding, storage and upkeep. I suppose it's fitting that Murkov have invested in a meat hauling company for cattle, since they treat their subjects just like cattle. And then we have Heavy Pop. These consist largely of violent children or adolescents that have been subjected to hormone therapy and limb extension surgeries to have increased their speed considerably. This new augmented strength means they are impossible to control through physical restraints, but have been conditioned for obedience. They have almost a childish cognitive framework and should be considered extremely dangerous. It even says under the doctor's note to avoid accidental contact with the groin area since they are easily aroused. Jesus. Their childish mind does prove useful to Murkov, however, since they will believe almost anything that they're told. Then there's the pouncers, largely consisting of people considered as sadomasochist paranoiacs. These are people that derive sexual pleasure from pain, while also being incredibly paranoid. It says that they were selected from patients at Mount Massive Hospital due to their paranoid tendencies. And as a quick reminder for people, Mount Massive Hospital is the location of the first Outlast game, and due to the connection with Dr. Vernick, this is of little surprise. The pouncers have nails, wire and scavenged bits of metal that they've pushed into their skin and are also known to enjoy some self-inflicted shrapnel from time to time. Due to their heightened paranoia, pouncers tend to ramble about fantasies of the worst possible outcome futures, things that they fear that will happen. The doctors believe that they should listen closely to these fantasies, as they might prove as inspiration for future trauma vectors to use on reagents. Now for screamers. The perfect screamer is somebody that is extremely sleep deprived. They were gifted from the paperclip people at Los Alamos for the trials at the Sinyala facility and were inspired by experimentation in German war camps during World War II. Since these concentration camps, experimentation revealed guided treatment that could greatly alter vocal cords, causing them to scream louder. Pair this with the morphogenic engine therapy that was used to encourage them to scream when somebody was in close proximity to them. It could stun anybody nearby to them. The people at Los Alamos used the techniques found in Germany and created what was possibly the worst form of existence you could imagine. Using amphetamines, they have created a never-ending waking nightmare for these people. 
They are always in a state of near sleep, meaning they are sleeping at all times while also never sleeping, and are near catatonic while being sensitive to sound and motion. They are literal walking alarms, essentially. The doctors describe their mental state as constant hallucinations, anxiety and psychosis, and that they are in a steady decompensation towards greater and greater suffering. Dear God. Easterman hopes that the screamers will actually have a calming effect on the reagents in the trials, as they encourage a slower and more thought out approach to the trial. Next up are the imposters. Sneaky ones, these are. If you run around the trial, you might spot somebody that looks awfully like someone in the reagents team, only for them to get close to you and start stabbing away. These are imposters. They are largely just general pop, but have been given latex masks in order to imitate the reagents. They are used to teach the reagents to essentially trust nobody. It mentions that imposters are put into the environment nude and are left to scavenge clothing from the corpses and even take pieces of metal or glass to serve as their weapon. But they are considered very dangerous since they normally have a childish playful nature while also being incredibly sadistic. There have been cases in the past where imposters have managed to steal clothing from the Sinyala staff, taking on the appearance of scientists. There's even a warning that states that it's good practice for Sinyala staff to greet their colleagues regularly and look to see if they respond without moving their lips or to appear to be giggling without smiling to see if it's actually an imposter or not. By the way, that sounds creepy as all hell. Then we have the berserkers, patients that have been repurposed from a prison experiment in weaponized syphilis. This engineered strain of syphilis has resulted in blindness and dementia in the patients, but were relocated from the prison to Los Alamos, where steel pins were surgically inserted into sensitive skin areas for increased awareness. Murkov compensated for their blindness and disorientation with increased strength and aggression, using limb lengthening therapy and hormone treatment, much like the heavy pop. The notes actually show that berserkers are one of the few archetypes that display Dr. Vernick's theories of lateral ascension, since they find enlightenment at the extremes of pain, resulting in them to almost worship violence against others. And as if it couldn't get any worse, berserkers have been recorded as having an unreasonable amount of animosity towards their ruined eyes, going as far as picking out their own eyeballs and then continuing into the cavities beneath until they damage their own frontal lobes in their brain, causing a self-lobotomy. It notes a warning to Sinyala staff to not engage in conversation with the berserkers, as previously, healthy staff have engaged in self-harming after prolonged exposure to them. And finally, we have our last archetype, the pushers. They're made up of previous staff members at Sinyala, who have been driven to psychosis due to chemical exposure and proximity to trial populations. They are equipped with basic aerosolized medication equipment and are encouraged to create their own psychoactive compound. Their evolving amphetamine and hallucinogen mixture has managed to stay one step ahead of reagents drug tolerance and almost always causes temporary psychosis to the reagent. The pushers have a perceived relationship with the so-called Skinner Man Murkov related the relationship between that of a child with a overly affectionate uncle or a trusted priest. God damn it, man. Sinyala and Murkov staff have encouraged to use pushes as an example to always maintain strict security protocols and mental hygiene. And also that with every accident comes opportunity for innovation. And that wraps up the background of each of the archetypes that can be found throughout the Sinyala facility. Our next data document comes as another Hendrik Easterman journal entry that explains that Vernick continues to haunt the sleep room, that he seems completely uninterested in any Murkov staff, instead focusing completely on the reagents in the sleep room as they rest and recover for trials. What is also interesting is that Easterman mentions he watches Vernick from hidden vantages, showing that somewhere in the sleep room, Easterman is watching from hidden areas. Vernick has been watching reagents sleep, and even participating in some patients' paralytic trauma therapy. Easterman is concerned by his involvement, as Vernick's work is centered on dreams and superstition, and Easterman is concerned that it could pose a threat to Leith too. We also have a transcript between Bradley Avalanos and James Lawler, as they discuss a new program called the Program Geister, a program that is in collaboration with Dr. Vernick's lab. It's mentioned that Avalanos is trying to get the CIA's approval on the program from Lawler, but Lawler brings up Cuba, 
saying that Castro is making all the worst enemies and that the agency is not averse to spending money right now as a result. Avalanos feels that Geister is a more aggressive program than Paperclip or Lathe and could see results quicker for the CIA, going as far as saying that Vernick describes Geister as nightmare material, which interests Lawler, giving permission for the agency's approval. On October 1st, Avalanos took the proposal of Project Geist to the Murkov board, stating that Los Alamos have identified extraordinary commercial potential and unexpected side effects of Lath 2, using Reagent 0877 as reference. The side effect in question is the extrasensory activity that relates to the Skinner Man in particular. While the hallucinations are remarkable in their own right, the fact that unrelated reagents in separate trials see him as extraordinarily provocative for Los Alamos. Dr. Vernick has found out that an increase of reagents hallucinations have been correlating directly with seasonal change, despite the Signala's facility's complete removal of outside variation in light and temperature both. Thus, Dr. Vernick proposes trials in Program Geister, which would entail scheduled chemical encouragement and guided trauma of the reagents, of which all the results would be shared with Los Alamos and Mount Massive. Avalanos also says that the CIA approves of the program and will offer extra outside funding to further entice the board. We can see that it only takes two days, since on October 3rd, the board officially authorizes Program Geister. All results will be shared to Los Alamos, Mount Massive and the CIA respectively. The trials will be under the authority of Dr. Vernick, and it is also stated that there was a handwritten note at the bottom of the approval letter to Avalanos, asking him to call them, and that there are dangerous expectations from the board relating to Project Geister. A few days later, on the 6th of October, Clyde Perry puts in a request for transfer to the Signala facility. He mentions that he will be unable to continue his work in the collections department following his injuries and connections to his recent surveillance. If you don't remember, Clyde Perry was responsible for the surveillance of Officer Coyle and was severely injured by Coyle during said surveillance. He says that the doctors have reconstructed his leg and skull enough to get him back to Murkov for further treatment, but feels that his mobility will never return to its former level. He asks for reassignment before committing himself to Murkov Corporation's cause. We see nothing relating to Perry for quite a few weeks following his transfer request, but there is a transcript of a conversation that took place between Avalanos and Perry on the 18th of October. Avalanos is informing Perry of an internal leak within Murkov, saying that dozens of memos, letters, transcripts and photographs have been leaked into the trial environments. <laughs> and what is probably the closest thing to a fourth wall break since the leaks he is describing are the files that the reagents find throughout the trial, the very documents that we're discussing now. Avalanos feels that the leak is controllable, but Perry is more concerned. He doesn't understand how this could have happened, but both have a theory that the pushers could have been responsible for the leak, since they were once Signala staff and have since turned into part of the trial population, which would make them likely suspects. But Avalanos points out that since the trials are sealed environments, there isn't really much to worry about. Perry refutes this mentioning that one day the reagents will be sent back into the real world, and that causes reason for concern if they were to leak some information. Avalanos is still not that concerned, to be honest, saying that the reagents are pumped full of chemicals, so any memory inside the trial will likely be subconscious, and since reading is boring, nobody would possibly want to read them. I won't lie, that felt personal, but I'll let it slide. Avalanos offers Perry his reassignment, something that he calls the Department of Historic Refinement. It would have three directives, in descending order of urgency. Number one, discover the source of the leak and how the documents have been scattered throughout the trial environments. Number two, the removal of said documents from the trial environments. And third, the suppression of any leaked information and dissemination of tangent information to corrupt or confuse any anti murkov narratives. Perry, uh, agrees to this reassignment. On November 20th, Perry contacted Easterman, telling him that during his review of the leaked Murkov communications that he has noticed some inaccuracies with the documents. He asked Easterman to inform his staff to be more careful in the editorial department, since the documents have misspelled words, incorrect dates, complete historical inaccuracies, 
stating that if it continues, he'll be forced to bring it up with the board. Easterman responds the following day, telling Perry to cease from bothering him with his perverse fixation on spelling or accuracy, stating that he's not a librarian or a country clerk, fixing dates and events for the bureaucracy. He is in the business of discovery, before finally stating that the past is fungible, only the future is set. And that, my friends, covers the newly released documents that can be found in the Project Geister update of Outlast Trials, which includes a brand new program. If you've made it to this part of the video, please put Easter Geist in the comments down below. Why not? Let's mix up the holidays. I'll be doing a few more videos in Outlast Trials, including some information on our third prime asset, Whitehorn, in the future. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please remember to like the videos. It helps us out a lot. And of course, to subscribe for more story related content in the future. Until next time, guys, peace.